It's a speed. Suppose, no oh, questions before I do my suppose. Suppose I started this 10 meters higher. So it starts at 40 and I end the problem at 20 meters above the ground. So all I would do is just shift those, both the beginning and final heights by 10. How will the answer change? Two meters higher. Say it again. I thought it should be the same. Okay. Suppose I started, dropped this box starting from rest at 20 meters and I wanted to know how fast it's going at that moment just before it touches the ground. What would change? So I basically took this and shifted it down 10 meters. What would change in my final speed? Why? You're covering less distance. No, I'm still covering 20 meters. Oh. Therefore, what would change? But some of you, I, I feel pretty sure some of you have the answer if you're just afraid to. It would stay the same. Yes, there we go. Yeah. What would change over here was that if I shifted it down 10 meters, that this would be 20 and zero where I shifted up 40 and 20, but I'd still get the same answer. Because what really matters is not the actual value of potential energy, but the change in potential energy. Change in potential energy is crucial. This gives this and that plus C. This is what allows us to do the, what, the following. I can make my initial height zero anywhere I want. My recommendation is to make h is equal to zero either at the beginning or the end. Thus, when I said this, when you said this was 10, I said, well, if that's 30, that's got to be 10. Because whatever that is, this is 20 less than it. But I would say, well, why don't we just go ahead and say, right at the bottom, let's make that h is equal to zero, right there. Why? Because I said so. I don't need to justify it in terms of solving it. So what that does to my problem here is this is now 20 and this is now zero. My final height is right where I said h is equal to zero, which now makes this 980 is equal to 2.5 vf squared plus zero. That's now zero. Which is what we have right here. So by making h is equal to zero where it's convenient, where we can get rid of a term, we simplify the what we have to do. There's nothing, the only thing the ground provides here is the gravitational pull. The position of the ground is irrelevant, unless we go you know, 100 kilometers up, then it might make a difference. Then we're dealing with this. All right, let's take a look at this from a slightly different point of view. What is the weight of this object? No, Ooh. that's the max. Oh, John. John. What is five kilograms? Mass. Yes, the mass, not the weight. What's the weight? Is it five kilograms? Is it 49? Yeah, 49. I think you were saying it. They'll say. I was saying the whole uh, weight. So it'd be like five times. Yeah, or 9.8 for a generic problem. Yeah, on Earth. So, and it ends up being 49 meters. So the graph, the Earth is pulling on this thing, 49 meters for the duration of the problem, which is 20 meters. 
So if I look at that, that's 49 newtons times, this is the force that the Earth exerts, times the displacement. The thing goes down 20 meters, so times 20 meters. So I have 49 newtons times 20 meters. So the math problem is 49 times 20, which is 980. Yeah. What would the units be? Meters per second squared? No. Think about what I multiplied. Meters per meter? What, where did you say between Newton and meter? Multiplication. Oh, multiplication. <laughs> you generally just say this Newton meters. Yeah. Newton, Newton meters. per meter? Meters. Newton, not per, no per, just Newton meters. You get, generally, when you multiply units like that, you put a dot in between it, that indicates there's multiplication. And for the capital N, lowercase m, it, it's not particularly crucial, but it is if you say meter newtons. Uh, a meter newton would be this with a dot in between it. A millinewton is that, so that's why the dot is generally preferred. All right, so 980 newton meters, and I will tell you physicists, lazy, lazy group of people, or some might say they try to be efficient, Newton meters is too much for them to say, so they came up with a new unit. <laughs> this Newton meter right here is known as a joule, symbolized by a capital J. So I want to take a wild guess at the person, at the scientist who is being honored. Julius Caesar. Oh, you went way too more complicated, <laughs> although I like that guess. Let's start out with a simpler one. The unit of Newton, who is, who is being honored with that one? Newton. Yes. Joule, who's being honored for that one? Joule. Yes, there you go. <laughs> Not the singer. Uh, Robert Prescott, Joule. So what was that, what we were solving for over there? Uh, just the force times the displacement. Okay. Why? Is that the ultimately your question of why yeah. would we bother? Yeah. Because this, 980 joules is the work done by the Earth. This is the work done by the Earth. To the box. turns out there's a relationship between work and energy. We got this from the change in potential energy. Uh, this comes from work. And so we have, it turns out, that conservative work, which is conservative force times displacement. There's a dot in between here. It needs to be a dot in between. There's two ways, there's two ways of multiplying vectors. There's called dot products and cross products. This is a dot product. It does make a difference. The conservative work is equal to the negative change in potential energy. My potential energy started up high, started up at, uh, let's just pick zero where I selected it. So my potential energy started out at uh, 980 joules. My final potential energy was zero joules, so my change in potential energy was negative 980 joules. I lost 980 joules of potential. That got transformed into kinetic. My conservative work was positive 980. My potential was negative 980, so negative of my change in potential would have been positive. But wait, there's more. 
the total work, which would just be the total force, times the displacement, that's equal to the change in kinetic energy. This right here, for some reason, is known as the work energy theorem. And from my point of view, it's true just because they define work and they define kinetic energy so that it works. It, I don't know why it's a theorem, but is they define theorem, everything to make it work. Is theorem EM or OM? Theorem, I think it's EM. You have to be questioning myself now. I think it, I'm pretty sure it's EM, but I reserve the right to change my mind. Well, if we think about it, total work is just my conservative work plus my non-conservative work, because I have only two kinds. So my total work would be my conservative work plus my non-conservative work. And that's equal to my change in kinetic energy. My conservative work is just my negative change in potential, so I'm going to put that substitution in there. So negative change in potential plus my non-conservative work is equal to change in kinetic well, let's get that over to the other side. So I'm going to add delta U, add whatever my change is to both sides. So what I'm left with on the right, on the left-hand side is non-conservative work. And on the right-hand side, I have the change in kinetic plus my change in my potential, which is just my change in energy. So we have the three work energy relationships. Work conservative is equal to negative change in potential energy. Work total or net is equal to change in kinetic. And work non-conservative is equal to change in total energy. The three work energy relationships. Side note, is it possible if you can pick those markers up? Because my anxiety is going to the roof that you're going to fall oh. over them. Sorry. Just... To date, I had a trip over. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I have. Or I think constant, I'll remember it. Sorry. Yep, no problem. In the other classroom, I would constantly drop markers that were starting to fade. So Ms. Sasson collected them all, put them in a box, and wrote on it markers that have anger, Dr. Fox. Does the, um, the last study, does that say net? Yes, net or total, or whichever one you like. So what we're going to do now, is we're going to take a break, walk it off, whatever you need to do, get a drink of water, you know what to do during your break. We're going to come back and we're going to find out if the work energy theorem actually will hold out in an in-class demonstration. <laughs> and if it does, tears of joy. Probably not on the outside, on the inside, but there will be tears of joy. We've come back already in progress. All right, so I've got the two masses there. I've got my initial speed. I know how far that each going to move. And uh, I'm going to add, so, M, or call it M3, was 10.00 grams or 0 0.01000 kilograms. Not a lot of change there, but it's enough. 
should be enough. So let's make our prediction and then test it out. All right, so I'm going to have the two masses here. Well, M1, M2. Uh, I'm going to add it to M2 plus. So this is going to end up being the sum of these two masses right here. So this will be 0 0.210 one oh kilograms. And this will be 0 0.200 one oh kilograms. What is the weight of mass one? Or how would you find it? Multiplied by 9.7 something. 9.7. Uh, it's a real experiment here, so we should probably use the real number. 2.8. I mean, sorry, 9.798. 9 9.798, 9 yeah. right. forces acting on it they're acting on the the larger one will be acting on the right on the side closer to you and the smaller one will be acting on the other side let's try to figure out what is the work done by the force due to gravity so the work done by the force due to gravity well it's doing work on both sides so it's got to be the work Done, for, done by the force due to gravity on mass one, and plus that which is done on mass two. Well, the force is for mass one, 1.905798. One times 1.3. Oh, one. So a little bit of gap there. There's a correction that we're going to need to make in just a second here. And then we have 2.0585598 times 1.3. Now, as it stands, there is a mistake here. Think about what the force due to gravity is doing to the two objects. What is the force due to gravity doing to this? If I cut the rope, what would the force due to gravity cause this to do? More specifically, yes, you're right. It starts at rest and then starts falling, so it speeds it up. That mass down there, which is going up, if I took an object and I threw it up into the air, what would the force of gravity be doing to it? Yes. So in one case, the force is causing, is causing this to speed up, but it's causing that to slow down. Um, if the force is in the direction of movement, it's trying to speed it up. That's positive work. If it's trying to slow it down, if it's acting opposite the direction of movement, 
That's negative work. So when I do F, that's what this dot here is. If they're in the same direction, you just multiply them normally. If they're opposite directions, it's negative. If the force is trying to help the movement, it's positive. If the force is trying to hurt the movement, it's negative. If the force is perpendicular to movement, it's zero. So this is negative. Because for mass one, mass one is going up, but the force of gravity is down. And we now add these together. We get the amount of work that we're predicting the gravitational force will do. Do not. 